Every product around you, no matter how simple it looks, is made up of precisely designed parts that must fit together in just the right way. A car engine might have over 30,000 individual components. A consumer laptop has hundreds of mating surfaces that all have to align from screw bosses in the chassis to precision hinge shafts. So how do engineers ensure that all of these parts fit together every single time across millions of units manufactured on different days by different machines and sometimes even in different factories? It's honestly pretty simple. It all comes down to fits, tolerances, and tolerance stack-up analysis. Three concepts that every mechanical engineer must understand if they want to be employable and design parts that can be assembled. In this video, we'll discuss what tolerances are, how to select the right fit for your designs and applications, and how to verify that your designs will assemble properly. By the end, you'll not only know how to specify tolerances the right way, but also have a killer workflow that you can follow to ensure all of your designs assemble perfectly every single time. So when designing in CAD, whether that's SOLIDWORKS, Creo, NX, CATIA, or your CAD software of choice, we specify nominal dimensions for various features. I like to call them quote unquote perfect numbers. For example, a shaft might be modeled as exactly 10 millimeters in diameter and the hole it fits into might be exactly 10 millimeters as well. On the computer, that's a perfect fit, but when we go to manufacture those parts, nothing ever comes out exact. The whole diameter might come out to be 9.97 millimeters because of drill wear, while a shaft might end up 10.03 millimeters due to tool deflection. That's why in the real world, dimensions are meaningless without tolerances. A tolerance defines the allowable variation from the nominal or the amount of wiggle room you give manufacturers. For example, the shaft diameter is 10 plus minus two hundredths of a millimeter. This tells the manufacturer that the part is is acceptable anywhere between 9.98 and 10.02 millimeters. Anything outside of that range nope. is out of spec and will get rejected. The combination of the nominal dimension and the tolerance defines the true size range that will actually exist in production. Now, all of this seems pretty basic, right? But bear with me. Fundamentals are so important. Not all processes can hold the same tolerances. So a CNC lathe cutting steel might easily maintain plus minus one hundredths of a millimeter. However, an injection molded plastic housing might vary between plus minus five hundredths of a millimeter to one tenth of a millimeter due to material shrinkage. A sand cast aluminum part may have plus minus five tenth of a millimeter or worse. Even within one process, factors like cool wear, temperature drift, operator setup, and machine calibration all affect consistency. That's why before you add any tolerances to a drawing, you should ask what process will be used to make this part. For example, let's take a look at this aluminum motor housing for an electric scooter. It's die cast to form thin walls, ribs, and mounting bosses that would be impossible or costly to machine. Applying CNC level tolerances like plus minus one hundredths of a millimeter across the entire part would drive cost up because die casting naturally varies due to shrinkage and mold wear. Instead, only critical surfaces such as the bearing seat or motor alignment face should hold tight tolerances while the ribs and cosmetic areas remain looser. This ensures the part is both precise where it matters and economical to produce. A seasoned mechanical engineer always matches tolerance expectations to the process capabilities. A common rookie mistake is to apply extremely tight tolerances to every dimension thinking that it improves quality. In reality, that's one of the fastest ways to make a design unmanufacturable. Tighter tolerances don't just increase increase machining time. They can also require additional finishing operations like grinding or honing, precision fixturing, 100% inspection, and higher scrap rates. Costs rise exponentially, often with no improvement to function. So let's imagine we're designing this aluminum gear housing. The location of these two bearing bores that support the gearbox is critical. If they're misaligned, the gears will bind. These bores should absolutely have tight position and diameter tolerances. But if you also hold the same tolerance on nearby cosmetic screw holes or rib features, which don't affect alignment or assembly, you're simply adding cost. Now let's talk about how two parts are designed to make. A pin and a hole, a shaft and a bearing, or even two interlocking plastic parts are defined by a fit type. So there are three main categories of fits. First is a clearance fit. Gaps 
shafts exist between parts. The shaft is smaller than a hole so it can slide freely. They are used in assemblies that require motion like pulleys, rotating shafts, and removable pins. Second is the transition fit. Depending on actual tolerances, the parts might have slight clearance or a light press. This is used where alignment is important but you still want disassembly to be possible. Third is an interference fit. The shaft is intentionally made larger than a hole. Assembly requires force, heat, or cooling. Once assembled, they act as a single unit, which is perfect for press fitted bearings or gears on a shaft. Now to make this systematic, we use standardized fit systems. The ANSI system, which is used in the US, adopts two letter codes like RC for running clearance, FN for force fit, or LN for locational interference, followed by a number that indicates tightness. For example, RC3 is a precision running fit and FN2 is a light force fit. The ISO system used globally expresses fits with one letter followed by a number like H7 and G6. Here H7 describes the tolerance zone for the hole and G6 is for the shaft. Once you know your nominal size and desired fit type, these tables tell you exactly what range of hole and shaft sizes will achieve that behavior. Let's walk through an example of designing a press fit connection. Suppose we want to mount a steel shaft into an aluminum pulley hub, like the kind used in an elevator's traction motor or an automotive belt drive system. The nominal diameter is 1.98 inches and we want a firm non-slip interference fit so the pulley can transmit torque reliably without any slippage under heavy load. Using the ANSI B4.1 system, we will select an LN2 fit, which is a low locational interference fit and is considered a true interference fit. Checking this standard table for a 1.9 inch nominal diameter, the typical permissible limits would be 1.98 to 1.9812 inches for a hole and 1.9814 to 1.9821 inches for a shaft. That results in an interference range of about 0.0002 to 0.0021 inches. In practice, this means that even a few ten thousandths of an inch determine whether the parts assemble correctly, require thermal expansion such as heating the hub or cooling the shaft, or risk distortion if the interference is too high. Getting these limits right ensures the pulley remains secure during repeated high load cycles such as an elevator hoisting or engine accessory drives. Now even if every part in your design individually meets its tolerance, assemblies often still fail. This is because tolerances accumulate a concept known as tolerance stack up. Now imagine assembling this portable bidet where the product has difficulty sliding a fluid canister into the device. Each dimension is within its tolerance, but if several dimensions are at their upper or lower specification limits, the combined variation causes the green cap to protrude beyond the sliding surface of the main canister body. Imagine we're producing hundreds of thousands of these and this failure were to occur on a production line or even even worse after shipment. The result is scrap, rework, and recall products, all of which could have been avoided by performing something called tolerance stackup analysis. There are three main methods of evaluating stackups, worst case, root sum square, and Monte Carlo simulation. Worst case analysis assumes that every dimension is at its extreme limit simultaneously, all high or all low. It gives a conservative result and guarantees function under any condition, but often drives overly tight tolerances and higher costs. Root sum square, on the other hand, assumes variations to be random and statistically independent. Instead of adding them directly, we take the square root of the sum of their squares. This gives a much more realistic estimate of actual variation for production parts, where it's statistically unlikely all dimensions will hit extremes at once. Monte Carlo simulations can be done with modern CAD tools, where thousands of virtual builds are simulated by random randomly varying each dimension within its tolerance range. This produces a distribution curve of assembly outcomes, allowing engineers to see if an assembly will work and what percentage of units will meet specifications. For high volume production, Monte Carlo is often preferred because it gives a probabilistic view of yield rather than a simple pass fail threshold. Now, before we continue talking about tolerance stackups, one of my favorite platforms that helped me learn and master key math 
math, physics, and engineering concepts and principles was Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant helps you become a better thinker and problem solver with thousands of visual interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Brilliant's lessons build problem solving skills by allowing you to play with concepts. This method is proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Brilliant's lessons are crafted by professors, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, and Google, so you learn from the best. Brilliant promotes critical thinking through active learning, not memorization, so you become a better thinker. It also helps build the habit of daily learning essential for both personal and professional growth. You can level up at home or on the go with Brilliant's interactive bite-sized lessons. One of my favorites is Brilliant's scientific thinking course that teaches you how to think like an engineer with lessons on gear systems, electric circuits, physical structures, and more. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash engineering gone wild, scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on the link in the description below. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. So now let's briefly walk through a practical tolerance stack up example. So let's imagine this gearbox that's manually operated by this hand crank that's attached to this input shaft and helical gear, which meshes with the worm gear that's attached to the output shaft. The gearbox frame, bushing boards, and gear boards all define the critical center distance and axial positions that control proper meshing and backlash. If that stack of dimensions shifts, the worm and helical gear can bind or develop excessive backlash, and the hand crank either becomes hard to turn or the drive slips. The center to center distance between the worm axis and the helical gear axis is a measurable assembly goal we can choose and validate with tolerance analysis. So I'm using SOLIDWORKS Toll Analyst, but you can use any software you like. We can start by defining the datums where all the dimensions will be measured from, and then define the dimensions and tolerances until everything is fully defined. You'll want to go through and do this for all the important components. For this example, it would be the gear frame, gears, and bushings. Finally, we need to select the goal or dimension that we want to view results for. So I'm going to pick the distance between the worm and the helical gear axis. Then we have to select the components in the order they would be assembled. Toll Analyst then automatically calculates the total variation using both worst case and RSS methods, showing the maximum and minimum gap that could occur. It even identifies which dimensions contribute the most variation, allowing you to focus your tolerance refining instead of arbitrarily doing it for every dimension. Before tolerance analysis software, mechanical engineers had to perform these calculations manually using spreadsheets. You would have to trace the dimension chain, apply plus or minus limits, and compute all of the extremes by hand. It worked but was slow and error prone, especially for assemblies with hundreds of parts. Today, tools like Toll Analysts calculate everything automatically, so there's absolutely no excuse not to run tolerance analysis on all of your designs. So to summarize, here's the workflow you should follow to ensure all of your parts fit together. First, identify the manufacturing process and understand its typical tolerance capabilities. Second, define functional requirements and which features actually affect assembly and performance. Third, apply standard features like ANSI or ISO to mating features based on intended function. Fourth, assign tolerances appropriately and tighten only where critical. Fifth, perform tolerance stackup analysis to validate assembly under railroad variation. Finally, step six is to refine tolerances iteratively to balance function, manufacturability, and cost. This systematic approach ensures that designs are not only dimensionally correct, but also feasible and economical to produce. The smallest details in tolerance control often make the biggest difference in product quality. Mechanical engineers who can design assemblies that fit perfectly on the first production run save companies enormous time, money, and rework. When we understand fits, assign tolerances intelligently, and verify our design with proper analysis, we eliminate uncertainty from the process. So next time you finish a design, ask yourself, have I chosen the right fits? Are my tolerances achievable? And will it still 
assemble when every part is at its worst limit? If you can answer yes to these, your parts will fit together every time. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here where I talk about one thing that completely changed my understanding of tolerances, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.